Welcome back to Project Squirrel, and we've got some good progress happening today. We're going to talk about pistons, which is a milestone step for me. So, I've got the barrels back from the from the engineer. The cylinder bores have been rebored to 20 thou over. Um, they were just in tolerance with staying standard, and remarkable it is standard after 65 odd years, but um, they were just within tolerance. I thought, well, we're going to the trouble and the effort of um, doing a nut and bolt restoration of this machine, we might as well give it the fighting chance and have it as good as we can. So I took, I knew I was having to get new pistons anyway, so we took the decision to have, have it rebored. Um, the old pistons uh, copped a fair bit of flack from, from the internet, haters, trolls, slash tag, aren't you experts about um, pulling this engine down? Uh, Oh, you'll wreck the pistons. Well, the pistons were a consumer bore, and I think I mentioned this before in a previous video. They were always going to be replaced anyway. Um, and hopefully you can see that in, in, in shot. Um, the marks on the skirt there, that's where it's been tight. So it started to drag it at one stage, and this is probably one of the better, better ones of them. So, yeah, they were always going to go. So, we're replaced with shiny new pistons and a clean bore. So today, I'm hoping we'll get the pistons on. We'll need to fit the camshaft followers and hopefully get the barrel sitting on the, on the cases. Big step forward. Now, I've seen a lot of engines be built on, on YouTube by um, all manner of experts and all levels of expertise. And often I've sat there going, <sighs> That's not how I was taught how to do it. And this was going to be the, that's not how you build an engine, this is how you build an engine video. But I also kind of realised that um, in the many years since I was taught engineering, um, things have moved on. So I actually had a good conversation with the engine reconditioner about this. And he sort of, he concurred with my thinking. Um, this is not an Alice Chev, it's not a, late model Japanese engine. Um, it's very old technology so I'm going to build it how I was taught and we'll step you through and explain what we were taught, why we were taught it and my being taught was probably closer to the age of the engine than if I were to build say an Alice Chev or something like that now. Um, I have gone over it with white petrol and cleaned all the um, engineering oil and everything off um, but Contrary to what appears to be the, the modern way of building engines, I am going to do ring gaps on it and I am going to put them together with oil. A couple of reasons for that. One, that's how we were taught to do it and I've never had an engine blow up. Actually I have had an engine blow up but racing engines, yeah, they're going to do that. Um, but secondly, this is going to be sitting for quite a long time before it actually fires up for the first time. So. Uh, steel on steel, I don't want any rust or corrosion or or letting them stick or anything. So I think we'll err on the side of caution and we'll put oil on it when assemble it. Um, again that's one of the things that we were taught. The reason why we put oil on them, um, obviously a little bit of lubrication when you put it together. Um, it removes some of the inherent danger of breaking a ring when you're assembling the engine. Um, but also the thinking of the time was a little bit of oil later um, will quickly turn to carbon and that helps the ring seal um, gives you a better chance of an engine working which back in the kind of 70s, 80s was yeah, that didn't last like they do now Why do engines wear out? Why do they burn oil? When a piston goes up and down the bore um, the bottom of the bore, it's obviously got to stop turn around, come up, hits compression stroke, a lot of energy going into the top of the piston. Um, so ignition fires, gets a lot of weight on it pushing it down. That weight will also push it into the side of the bore. Um, cycle continues. So when you pull down an old engine and measure it up, um, often there will be a lip at, almost at the top of the bore. Um, that is that point of where the piston stops gets hit with the, with the charge of fresh fuel, kind of gives a bit of a shake and goes down again. Over time that will form a lip. 
Um, the other things that happen is the bore gradually stop being parallel and become tapered. Um, and because we've got a because we've got a conrod and a gudgeon pin in the middle, we have a thrust side and a non-thrust side. So again, over time, the cylinder bore will become oval. So it comes slightly oval, slightly tapered, and gets this ridge up in the top of maximum wear. So the ovality and the taper, again, as the piston goes up and down, it causes the rings to flex a little bit in and out. Um, when you get enough bore, effectively that turns into an oil pump. So that pumps any oil residue from the bore, it'll pump it up into the combustion chamber and you start burning oil. Another reason for engines to be worn out or to be diagnosed as worn out uh, it's when the piston rings lose their tension and this will cause load compression so the rings have lost their stretchiness um, so they're not forced out against the bore um, compression gases can go past dilutes the oil with um, with compression gas if you want of a better term uh, lets compression go past and the sump you get blow by uh, all those symptoms low power, hard to start, burning oil, um, fumes coming out of the rocker, that kind of thing. Typically that would be um, if the engine has been hot or um, could be timing set wrong or bad fuel or a bunch of other reasons. Um, funny enough these rings that came off here and God knows how old they are, um, again I mentioned it's standard bore, um, there's enough tension in those to actually punch my skin when I took these old ones off the piston for this demonstration. It's kind of interesting because it's certainly been hot because of the, the drag marks on the skirt um, but obviously not hot enough for long enough to, to lose tension on the rings. Really simple explanation but in a nutshell that's what happens when a, when a motor wears out. So we've been reboard, the head has been skimmed, or the head, sorry the block has been skimmed um, we're giving it as good a chance of life as we possibly can. The pistons. Pistons will usually have an arrow on them um, which is normally facing the, the forward direction of the, of the engine. Again, you've got a, a thrust side and a non-thrust side. Um, I'm guessing when they're built it's slightly heavier on the thrust side but um, sometimes gudgeon pins are offset too. I think some American V8s do that. So we've got an arrow which is usually pointing to the front. Um, I'm not sure if you can pick it up on the camera, but this one says arrow inwards. Now that's a bit of a give, um, bit of a clue because the square four just has one crankshaft coupled to the other. Um, it doesn't have a, it doesn't have an idle gear in between. So the front crank is counter rotating. Um, so effectively, the thrust for the for the rear crank is on this side, the thrust faces for the front crank are on this side, so the pistons actually point into each other. Like so. And the rear one will be like so. What else can we talk about? Ah, yes. Ring sticks. Now, you're probably not going to pick this up on camera, um, but piston rings can often have a, a little step in them. Um, these guys have two compression rings and an oil ring. Uh, in this case, the compression ring at the top um, has just got a square shoulder. The second compression ring has got a step in it. So, uh, these pistons came with the rings already on, which is actually a bit of a pain because I've got to take them off to do the ring gaps. We'll come to that in a minute. But if they were sitting in a pile like that, how would you know which way to put the step? Again, going back to apprentice school many years ago, in fact. I've drawn a little rough diagram of, of what I'm talking about here. Uh, 
Uh, excuse the background noise. Um, I came down here early this morning to do this video because it's filthy hot in Australia at this time of year and I thought I'd sneak down at like 7 o'clock before the neighbourhood wakes up and before it gets too hot so I can film this but um, as it turned out it's already really hot so I've opened all the doors and windows so uh, you're going to get a bit of nature and the occasional passing car so apologies for that. Now, looking at the end on to the ring so we can be well pretend that's square because it's my roughy sharpy drawing um, you can have a step in the ring on the inside or you can have a step in the ring on the outside um, you've got a pile of rings sitting here what do you do with them which way does it go doesn't matter um, as an impressionable young apprentice um, we were taught in apprentice school uh, the saying that we were given, which I've remembered to this day, so I uh, obviously amused a, a room full of 17 year old impressionable male minds back then, and I remembered it ever since because there was a lot of tittering and, and so forth at the time. And the little saying that we were given was if it's in, it's up, if it's out, it's down. Make of that what you will, but we all remembered it. So, the second ring in this one is a step ring, um, and its purpose is it's going to scrape any oil that might get past the oil control ring, and it's going to help scrape it down and keep it away. Uh, if it's in, it's up. To be honest, I don't remember why that was the case. Um, I think it was about. I think it was to do with capturing any compression gases that might um, get past the top ring and then they'll kind of sit in there and turn to carbon and create a seal and, and life will be good. This square ring is just that, it doesn't matter which way up you put it. Right, ring gap. Uh, ring gap is important because too much ring gap and fumes and oil and combustion uh, pressure can go past them, go down to the sump. Not enough ring gap. Uh, as everything heats up and load goes on the piston, uh, and the ring can't move, it can't kind of find its own equilibrium. They'll touch, it tries to expand, and the ring will break. Snap. Um, then you go back to, to loss of compression. You'll probably hear it ticking in the engine, and it'll score the bore, so not a good idea. Uh, you also what we need to be very very careful when we're putting the barrels on and frankly I'm not looking forward to this job because there's four pistons to do, they've all got to go on kind of the same time and there's only one of me and I've got a bit of figuring out how I'm going to do that yet um, because it's very easy to, to nip, a, uh, nip a ring when, you, when you're putting a piston in um, especially when they've got to come from the bottom rather than from the top as you would with say a car motor I'm going to switch off here for a bit. Um, we're going to take the rings off the off the new pistons. So when we're doing a ring gap, we put the ring in the bore, and then we take the piston and we slide it down to just below the oil control ring. Um, not so important on a on a reboard engine like this, but if it was an older engine. Going down that far down the bore will take you past that lip area, so you're into what the, I guess what the, the good part of the ball will be. Again, this is a thing that I've seen a lot on internet engine rear builders, where they haven't um, checked the ring gap. Again, it, it's been bored by a professional engine reconditioner, and um, the brand new, I say factory, but factory replica pistons and rings. Um, the same as when I was doing the, the big end bearings. It's not that I don't trust the engine conditioner, um, I trust his math implicitly, but I don't know anything about where these pistons came from or how they're manufactured. Um, they're most likely okay um, because they come from Dragonfly, reputable dealer. Um, they're only going to use reputable brands, but um, we don't know if the person putting them together was hangover on a Monday morning or something and he's 
throwing some wrong size rings on a piston and shove them off. Um, so really it's just double checking. It's, it's peace of mind. Right, enough waffle. Get these off, I'll get them measured up and we'll come back shortly. I'll take a couple of still photos of when we're checking the, the gap. Um, probably not a lot for you to see on the video because it's a bit kind of pokey down there. Uh, so we'll do that and then we'll come back when we're ready to put the pistons on the conrods. So here we go, the moment I've been both waiting for and dreading. Pistons are fitted to the conrods and um, they're a floating gudgeon, they're a interference fit through the um, through the big end eye. So if you have a look at my website you'll see the little puller I made. In fact I might even throw in a photo about now to show you what that looks like, just to help push the uh, push or pull the gudgeon in. Bring get to uh, lined up where I want them. Not on the thrust faces, but um, off. I've put in little chocks under the pistons, just so that they're doing this on my own is going to be a bit interesting, I think. Um, that'll hopefully help me get started. And I've also put like um, exhaust clamps around the, around the rings to compress them. Again, I'm doing this on my own, so every little help I can get. For those who have watched previous videos, You'll know that I have an opinion on um, gasket sealants. So what I've used is a um, Euro grade um, sealer. This stuff doesn't go hard, it doesn't set. It's um, that you use to hold Rolls Royces together. So if those leaky old barges can be held together with this, it's good enough for my leaky old barge. So I've got that on. All that remains, oh, I've put the cam followers in. I'm not sure if you can see that. So cam followers are sitting in there, and they've got little retainer pads. Um, they also have a little circlip, a funny setup. They've got a, a cutaway halfway down the follower shaft with a circlip in it. Um, that was a bit of a mission to kind of feed down the hole, but that should stop them from falling right out as well. I guess I can't delay it any longer. Let's see if we can get this thing on. Well, there was about 10 minutes of frustra okay, frustration, um, even with the clamps, kind of okay. I don't know if it, it was fully the full answer or it helped a little bit or helped a lot, I'm not really sure. Um, but certainly for the top ring, on at least the front two pistons, I had to get popping out and still had to poke around to the screwdriver and get them started. And that's gently tap down on each one and try and just drop the whole barrel's level um, but eventually everything straightened up, it came right uh, and they are all in now. So I just need to take the clamps off now without dropping anything down the hole, well, I have left the sump off um, just in case anything does fall out I can easily get it again and tighten up the, the base studs and it'll be starting to look more like an engine. Okay, I'll cut out now. I'll take these clamps off and we'll come back when we've got the, uh, the barrels fully home. Here we have it. The barrels are on, rings tightened up, and it's starting to look pretty damn schmick. Um, it's been quite an effort today, and no longer is it early in the morning, but it's still filthy hot, so this man deserves a beer and I think I'm going to enjoy it. So for those that have followed my previous videos, um, you may have noticed I've taken the timing side apart again. The um, reason for that was twofold. One, I wasn't real happy about the shimming job that I did, so um, I went and brought some shim stock, and if you brought that lately, uh, it ain't as common as it used to be. And I made up some new shims, and I spent a couple of hours this morning re-shimming the, the crank end float, so I'm, I'm happy with that now. Um, the other reason was, now that I've got the barrels on, I can time the camshaft and crankshaft, um, because I can TD see the number one piston, and I can... I have to read the instructions, but 
um, I've set a degree wheel on the other crank and I can degree the, the camshaft I can degree the timing chain um, almost impossible to do with the sprockets on um, because getting the chain to fit in there it doesn't have a joining link it's all got to go on together so it's a lot easier just to take all that back off um, it's only 10 minutes so next job will be setting up the timing and um, that will be a video on itself uh, the panel work is not far from coming back from the painter that is going to be a milestone moment uh, so it looks like the painting is going to be done before the top end is done we're still held up with valves and guides and a couple of other things from the UK so come on UK get that vaccine program going and get back working because my aerial is waiting for you um, so it looks like the panel work will be next we get the panel work on I'll do tyres, that's worthy of a, a short video because I'll recheck the wheels, they've been sitting for a couple of years now, probably three or four years, um, stainless steel spoke, spoke stretch, so I'll need to just give them a bit of a tweak up, put tyres on, um, and then it's going to be waiting for the valves and everything for the head. So there's not much more I can do but wait um, until the valves and guides come from the UK, whenever that might be. Um, so I've done the panel work and everything and the timing. It's going to be a bit of a delay in videos, I'm afraid. So I guess the only thing we can do is pop him on, make some vroom vroom noises, and look forward to progress happening. So thank you very, very much for those who have subscribed and liked my, my video journey. Um, it does mean a lot to me, and I appreciate your support. So until next time, thank you very much.